corporations are actually just one giant mega corporation. And I'm not talking about metaphorically. And I'm not talking about BlackRock. They're gonna pop the biggest financial bubble in all of history. It's a currency collapse. Who have you heard talking an awful lot over the last year about introducing a new kind of currency? Like, holy that There's so much more to this dig that I'm doing right now. I'm stoked to do all these pieces on it, but like, what an opener. Let's start with like, where are you from? What, where'd you grow up? I'm from Washington State and I grew up in Northwest Washington State. Um, the son of two teachers and a lot of my early years were spent working in teaching as well as traveling and um, working all kinds of different travel careers like cooking and stuff like that to just sort of explore the world. What was the turning point for you? The turning point was being a GameStop investor during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the GameStop stock community was doing a lot of research and just investigating of the financial system and corruption in the financial system based on what happened in 2021 and thereafter. And so that sort of inspired me to do my own learning about what's kind of going on in our financial world and in the money world. And one thing led to another and eventually Teaching is a changing art form and more and more as attention is being paid to online media and to social media. I knew that as a teacher, you almost have more ability to reach and teach if you're in the online spaces. So that had been on my mind for a long time. And, you know, two and two eventually came together. What was your involvement in GameStop? I was an investor from right after the initial squeeze that happened in 2021. And I invested and held and I still hold. Um, and for the most part, I was just a learner and an observer and was really interested in what was happening in terms of regular people starting to do their own research and sort of pick companies based upon their research rather than based upon financial news media. And then more and more, as we started to discover just how corrupt the financial system is and how few people on Wall Street and in these companies are doing anything to sort of speak about that corruption, the more conviction I gained over time. Um, so what's your take on how it all went down? I think that at the time it, it took a lot of people by surprise. And at first it seemed like it kind of came and went. And that is very much the picture that has been painted in the bigger scheme of things. But the more that I looked into it, the more that other people uh, around the world looked into it, the more we realized that actually it did not all kind of come and go and the repercussions of it are still reverberating through the markets to this day. And actually, I would argue that the story is still kind of chugging along in the background. And I'm expecting there to be another major development in that story coming in the next six months or so. Um, and I'm currently working with a team about a documentary of the whole storyline from 2021 and before the setup of what brought us there, as well as everything that's happened behind the scenes since. Um, so I don't want to say too much because I think that the public will you know, watch whatever unfolds as it unfolds. But I think that the way that corruption in our markets is sort of a rot at its core, I think that that is an inherently self-fulfilling prophecy that can't go on forever. And I think that what happened in 2021 was a major blip along that storyline. But I think there's a lot more to come on this sort of financial corrupt underworld of all of Wall Street that is still sort of eating itself from the inside out. It's blatantly criminal, some of the things that happened in 2021, um, from turning off the buy button on a single security or set of securities, um, pretty clearly on behalf of various powerful people, um, all the way to the way that news media portrayed it. Um, there was some alleged perjury that happened. So there was crime in front of our eyes, but then there's a lot of financial crime behind the scenes too, related to naked short selling and rehypothecation of shares, which is essentially printing free money. It's like having a money printer for people that are not the Federal Reserve. If you can just invent shares that don't exist and sell them into the market um, on loan. So I, I think that it opened up Pandora's box as to how many sort of gray areas of regulation have been sort of written into the, the, the law of Wall Street without any oversight or examination. And when it finally saw the light of day through this massive scandal at the time, it became common knowledge and, and far more uh, talked about just how many different sort of avenues of attack a corrupt actor has um, in Wall Street. So was this the beginning of your social activism? 
Yeah, actually, it's even more recent than that. I posted my first video in May of 2023, so I'm not even a year and a half into this. I've had a pretty meteoric rise. What do you think about that? <laughs> it's very weird. Um, my life changed overnight. Um, and it's it's cool because I think that coming from a teaching background, I think that I was well prepared to sort of start for the right reasons and thereby not really have to change anything as that evolved. Um, because really, I'm not... I'm not on social media to be an expert at anything. I'm not on social media to um, do anything other than learn because the initial impetus was there's so much that I don't know. And if I want to be an informed citizen, then I should get informed by learning. And as a teacher, I know how to do that. So I'll just teach myself. And basically my whole social media presence has been the process of me thinking about something I don't know about, researching it, sharing my research and sharing what I learn about it. And then often also sharing what I'm mistaken about and then learning from those mistakes and continuing to just expand my understanding. So it's it's been cool, but it's also been sort of a, a steady path from the start of just learning and there's no end to that. So it's, it's pretty exciting that my job is now just to learn and talk about it. I have a very funny teaching career where I started as a volunteer teacher when I was a freshman in high school. I started volunteering at the middle school that I had gone to teaching various after school clubs and after school programs. And because of my background growing up around it, my parents working in it, um, I started to just get referrals from one job to the next um, without ever actually getting an official teaching degree. So I was never like the third grade teacher at a public school, but I've taught almost every grade from high school to pre-K. And I've taught all kinds of different subjects from like assistant English writing teacher to science courses math and Spanish tutoring. I guess I did teach Spanish full on for a little while. So I've kind of done the full gambit at all sorts of interesting alternative. Uh, all, I think they were all private schools um, that allowed for a lot of really cool learning on my part and sharing with really cool kids, which was a lot of fun. So you left teaching kids behind, but now you're basically in a way <laughs> teaching the world. <laughs> I'm sure some kids watch my stuff too, but yeah, I see I don't see teaching kids and adults as being all that different. Um, we're all just lifelong learners. And I think there's a varying, to a varying degree, some people sort of stop learning at a certain point. And my hope would be that I can inspire them to start again, because the moment you stop learning is the moment that the world stagnates for you, that you start. I, I say, if you're not learning, you're dying. So I'm hopefully can be an inspiration for everyone to realize that learning is our responsibility, especially in a modern world where we all have smartphones. So what was the one topic that like, catapulted you? There's kind of two. In the early days, it was going into grocery stores and taking photos of different grocery aisles and the products on the shelves, and then researching what company makes that product and who owns that company and who owns that company that owns that company, and tracing the sort of financial ties of all of our products upwards to the top of that chain and showing in visual representation by just straight coloring on those photographs how many of our products are actually basically just product monopolies by a very few select number of corporations that are basically all run by the same interest groups and the same banks owning those public corporations and sort of demonstrating the lack of actual choice we have in our product space because that speaks to everybody everybody shops and everybody has this feeling of increasingly high prices for increasingly low quality products and that catapulted me in a big way at first. And then once I kind of, I got onto X at a certain point in that, in my trajectory. And shortly thereafter, the first P Diddy case came out. Tonight, they arrested P Diddy. News just broke that they took him into custody in New York City. And that got picked up in a really big way. And I did some of the first reporting on that first, um, the allegations by Lil Rod and the way that that tied to Michael Jackson and other sort of histories in the music industry and that reporting really exploded my platform too so what exactly inspired you to start your company it's kind of just a, a social media strategy really of realizing that on social media people are very judgmental and herd minded and i knew that if you start making a social media account trying to proselytize to people and teach them and tell them anything with authority they are not inclined to listen to you but if you start as a small business or a brand or a company then it sort of changes that frame of mind that people attach to you and i also wanted to have some form of in income generation some sort of revenue so i could sell some shirts and i wanted to be able to not wear corporate slogans on my chest but instead wear you know phrases like inflation is taxation or uh 
defund corporations or whatever, whatever it is that, you know, felt cheeky at the time. So it was a way for me to sort of like make my own slogans, make my own shirts and maybe generate some revenue. But I actually started it and didn't even tell anyone that I sold shirts. I sold maybe five shirts in the first five months of that company. And it was really just sort of a social media strategy to kind of, um, get people not thinking like, is this guy an expert? Who is this guy? What is this thing? And rather just think like, what's the information being shared? And what do I think about that information? Yeah, you said your parents were also educators, right? Yeah. Did um, they play a role in, in in shaping the way you saw everything? I mean, or, or are you just like completely opposite to their thinking? They certainly played a role in how I think and how I see the world. They were, they're integral to my whole worldview in terms of how I synthesize, how I ask questions, how I look for evidence, um, and how I parse evidence too, because parsing evidence is one of the most important skills in today's media landscape. And I attribute a lot of that to uh, both their parenting and the schools that they sent me to, because for example, my mom was the principal of a really, really cool private school that I attended through middle school ages. And that education from that school specifically really shaped my relationship to information. Um, however, nowadays, politically, we're very opposite. Um, and part of that is because they don't pay a lot of attention. They don't they don't like do any more. They don't do research. They don't really engage with politics very much. They're, they're old. They're retired. Um, whereas I'm very active and very engaged with learning and, and looking at what's going on. Um, but on a lot of things, we still agree, which I think is true of most of America. I think most Americans are made to feel as though they're so divided on everything. But realistically, I think most of our core values are basically all the same. And it's just a couple of culture war and hot button topics that get presented on the news that really split people apart. And you're pretty much uh, question everything kind of person, right? Yeah, I'm question everything. And I bias, I, I certainly have my biases. And my bias tends to be in the modern day to skew towards the side of the little guy, because the more I look into how money works and I follow the money in my investigations, more and more I just see repeated the pattern that the people that have the most money have the most power to obfuscate the truth or to skew the truth or to engage in lawfare or whatever it is to make it seem like their side is right. So I tend to take everything in and I skew towards the little guy getting a little extra weight, but I also try not to make up my mind too often. Even when I feel like I've done the research on something, I treat it as though now the probabilities of what is true have shifted, but I could always see new evidence that shifts it in a different direction. And were you always interested in journalism? Not really, honestly. Um, I spent most of my life just, I've always been a big picture guy and I've always been interested in big questions and big ideas, but it wasn't really until my late 20s um, that it started to become present in my life. And I think that I think that COVID-19 made it forced politics to be present in everyone's life in a big way. And it came at a time in my life where I'm 31 now. So that was my late 20s that that happened. And it was where you couldn't really escape it. If you did like, it sort of became very clear to me that the world is affecting us all, whether you know what's going on or not. And so the more you can know what's going on, the better positioned you can be to, you know, put yourself in a good position or prepare yourself for the future or whatever it is. So journalism has really entered my life in a concrete way and more in the last three or so years, um, though the ethics and the sort of base principles have always been who I am. Now, I know you're very critical of mainstream media. And in fact, I remember having this conversation with Jay Kumar, who reached out to you. I said, well, I don't think he'll do this interview as he doesn't <laughs> like the media. We should be critical of every institution um, from government to corporations to even just people with a lot of money, because the more power you have in this world, the more ability you have to, you know, pull strings and to do things. And, but at the same time, I think it's important to engage in genuine conversation with everybody. And I, we live in a day and age where people are often trying to group people up and sort of simplify things. And the mainstream media is a great example where it's easy to smear all mainstream media as being one corporate like conspiracy. But realistically, it's a large institution made up of thousands of individuals that all have their own opinions and their own jobs and their own lives. And so I think I do a disservice to my own opinion if I don't engage in conversations with, you know, as many people as possible, um, regardless of what I might have preconceived notions of. What exactly, in your opinion, is uh, the media doing wrong? I think there's a lot of ways to answer that question. And I think you could take a lot of different avenues that would all be really interesting conversations. But maybe the one that comes to mind first and might be most interesting in my mind right now is 
not necessarily what the media is doing wrong on their own, but what is happening in the world at large in the public's mind and how the, the sort of corporate news is not adapting to it well enough in that we have lived in a world and I grew up in this world as a millennial where there are talking points and there's, you know, there's like programming with air slots and everything is very just controlled and you get the advertisements, then you get the slot, then you get the advertisements. And the more people have sort of grown into that, the more they, I, I think we didn't realize how stagnant that can feel until we started to get things like podcasts and things like digital media where you're getting um, unfiltered takes from people and you feel this humanity through that format that's really hard to convey in a mainstream media setting and is often, and I'm speaking from the outside here, but I, it seems to me that it's often not either discouraged or just not nurtured in a mainstream media setting. And so even if you have a great person going to work as a mainstream newscaster, it might be very hard to come across as genuine when you have these various things you have to sort of like fit into that show. Whereas me, I get to just turn my phone on and speak directly to people with whatever my opinion is and whatever the setting is. And I think that people have been hungry for that sort of genuine connection more and more as the world gets more and more divided and digital and, and cold. And so I think there's this natural desire for that, that the mainstream media inherently is not well positioned to fill. Yeah, I, I hear you. I remember many, many years ago, Steve Edwards, who used to be our, our uh, host on Good Day LA, um, told me I, I was really nervous and coming into this new group. And he said, just be you. Don't try to be this anchor person or this reporter person. Just be you. Mistakes and all. People will either hate you or love you. It doesn't matter, but just be genuine. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think that uh, some of that is missing. You know? Yeah, It also goes a long way towards making it sustainable for you yourself. And I think this is something, I mentioned this a little earlier, where because I had been a teacher, I am sort of have already gone through the learning curve of realizing that if you start to make your persona on that job be an act, then you're spending all your time at work acting and that's really tiring and it can be a really leading cause of burnout whereas if you make the way you teach or the way you present on on camera just natural then it's it's actually not so tiring at all it's almost it can be cathartic to just be you and i think that the more the most natural people become the most like connected and popular in whatever their setting is because it just feels good to watch someone who is uninhibited by all the other garbage that most of us pile onto ourselves needlessly i think so let's talk about diddy yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness in your opinion why did it take so long to expose this in my opinion the evidence that has come out so far all paints the picture of something much bigger than diddy it paints the picture of him having protection from law enforcement and him having some sort of agreement with law enforcement, whether that's a, literally from the federal authority of the FBI or from some like splinter organization within the FBI, or it's hard to say, but there are lots of claims over the years from the rumor mill of Diddy having some sort of federal protection. And then there's also direct allegations within a couple of these different suits that claim that he either had police or federal sort of cover. Um, and and what we see outwardly as far as how he's been acting for so long and how much he's allegedly been doing behind the scenes with no one going after him, it all adds up to he is not the top of this thing, but is rather a useful pawn. Um, and hope, and I think in their minds, hopefully a a place where you can cut the strings and set him free and, and pin it all on him is what it seems to be from my perspective. So I think that he was useful and protected for a very long time because he became very powerful. He rubbed shoulders with a lot of very important people and he was really doing exactly what it looks like he was supposed to do. And it was only as you can kind of trace his belligerence becoming more and more egregious and his violence becoming more and more unhinged as his power grows and his ego grows it it feels like he was sort of overextending his welcome simultaneous to maybe coincidentally it's hard to say cassie ventura drops her civil lawsuit and it feels like when she dropped her civil lawsuit it was either salacious enough 
or evidenced enough or public enough that his like the thinness of his thread was too thin for him to stay protected and whoever had been protecting him just finally said we're out we're not covering for you anymore and in part him settling with cassie for probably a lot of money opened the floodgates for more lawsuits and, and so it sort of became open season on diddy and i think that whatever was protecting him before wanted to wash their hands of it I remember speaking with a criminal law attorney who said he should have settled that case immediately because the longer it just dragged, it just became a bigger problem for him. Yeah. I don't know if that's accurate or not. The executives, the music executives who just resigned, like was, was it on the same day or the next day? It was the next day. <laughs> what do you make of that? Right now, I think it's probably a coincidence. Um, the guy, specifically this Lyles guy that resigned, who was big up at... Uh, so Diddy is in the Universal Music Group umbrella, and this other guy is in the Columbia Records umbrella, I believe, um, at Atlantic. And um, and he's not like super directly related to Diddy. He's very related to Jay-Z, who is very related to Diddy. Um, and, and there it is suspicious, but at the same time, uh, people point out pretty wisely that a lot of corporations' fiscal quarters end around this time of year, around September. Um, and so it's not an illogical time for someone to step down. It's just a weird day to announce it. And it seems like a pretty abrupt stepping down, that guy in specific that I was referring to in the pieces I've done about him. Um, I think time will tell. I think it's important not to over-speculate because you start to debase your own perspectives and you start to debase what is true. But it is important to keep our eyes out and and to look carefully because... One thing that I always come back to is that I think most normal people don't have any reason to think about is that right now we're kind of talking about investigating a covert intelligence agency operation. It might just be Diddy doing evil stuff, but it might be more nefarious than that. And if it is more nefarious than that, we're talking about the tactics of covert intelligence agencies. And the whole point of that is plausible deniability. And so operations like sexual blackmail operations are designed to be deniable, unprovable, and untraceable. And so inherently, we need to be looking for evidence that is hard to put together. And you might have to do a little speculating in a reserved way to look for where the next clues might lead to see if you find evidence there. Not to assume it's all true, but just to you know stay on the trail of what might be true. Um, so that's the way I look at it is it's hard to know what's real at this point. Right. Well, I mean, the prosecutors made it very clear that this isn't over. I think that the way that a RICO investigation tends to go, you like it was designed to take down the mob and the mafia. And RICO investigations usually would go from the bottom upwards. Um, in this case, Diddy's not the bottom by any means, but there, there are a lot of other people for them to go after. And I do think that Jay-Z is high on the list of probable suspects. And I think that it's important to talk about him because the rumor mill of the hip hop industry has long accused Jay-Z of all the same crimes as Diddy. And Jay-Z was basically made by P. Diddy back in the day. A lot of people don't know that Jay-Z was just a kid on the music scene back when Tupac and Biggie Smalls were the kings of the, of the industry. Back when Diddy first came to fame, when Tupac and Biggie Smalls were both mysteriously murdered with a lot of allegations pointing back towards Diddy and his associates. And Jay-Z came in to fill the void behind Biggie Smalls. Jay-Z was sort of living in Biggie Smalls' shadow as a little kid on the scene. And then when those two guys were murdered, Jay-Z rose to power. And he was best friends with Diddy through that whole rise and was at all the same parties. They dated a lot of the same girls. There's a lot of allegations of them passing girls back and forth. There's a lot of allegations of them being gay together and keeping that a secret. And so when you look at the power that Jay-Z has amassed and the people that he associates with outside of the music industry, it, it paints a picture where if he is guilty of a lot of these same crimes, I can only imagine the level of protection that he has. And I can only imagine the sweating that's going on behind the scenes that it doesn't trace back to him. Because the more of those big sort of rap kingpins that do come down with this, the more people start to look at the politicians they were associating with and look at the, you know, executives and the media figures, the other celebrities outside the music industry that they were affiliated with. And those people do not want that attention. It seems like some of the celebrities are already deleting some of the pictures from yeah. his past, right? And maybe just because they don't want to be connected with someone who was doing all of this and perhaps they didn't even know about it.
Yeah. That's a tricky one because a lot of those allegations have been flying around without proper vetting. And even I have sort of like gone into them a little bit without proper vetting. And then as I did, I realized that some of them were actually like, like, for example, uh, Megan Fox is one that got floated around a lot on social media this week. And she had actually already done that prior and people just hadn't noticed it and then reported it as though she did it yesterday. Um, so it's hard to say what is what as far as people deleting their social media, but I, I'm reminded uh, comically of Elon Musk recently retweeting his old tweet of something to the effect of Twitter is a social media agency and Twitter is also a crime scene, meaning he has all of it. So like deleting your Twitter account is not going to protect someone from actual criminal investigations. It might protect them in the, you know, court of public opinion as people like myself dig through these things and start to talk about all this baggage in people's past. But um, I, I don't know as that's necessarily going to lead us to any smoking guns, so to speak. Going back to, to Diddy's situation, I mean, there's no coming back from this, right? Absolutely not. No. I think at first there were there was an avenue of speculation where before he was arrested and before they leveled RICO charges against him, there was a level of, eh, maybe this lawsuit's going to get settled. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe he'll recover just because we've seen that happen so many times before. But at this point, it's pretty clear that everyone's cutting their ties. His protection is gone. He's being dragged through the media and embarrassed in every way imaginable. Um, and, and so, no, I don't think there's any coming back from this. And I start to, I mean, my mind is on, is he going to have a strange suicide accident in prison because of all of the powerful people that he has dirt on? And if I was in his shoes right now, I would know there was no coming back from this. And his only avenue towards an ounce of freedom in the future is probably to cut a deal and start talking. And I don't think a man of Diddy's morals and integrity, as we've seen alleged by all these women, I don't think that man has a whole lot of morals and integrity when it comes to his friendships, when his life is on the line like this. So, so he could end up having some sort of accident. I sure hope not, but he's on suicide watch right now. And he's in the exact same jail that Jeffrey Epstein was in when he allegedly committed suicide. Um, so I think we're all hoping that Diddy doesn't Epstein himself in the near future, because we're all curious to hear what he says. Going back to Epstein, um, you don't believe he committed suicide? Not one bit. I think that any any real analysis of the number of coincidences that befell him on that day paired up with the number of powerful people that he had been blackmailing over the years, people in the U.S. government that would have access to the U.S. penal system in some regard, I think it's kind of beyond any reasonable doubt that Epstein did not kill himself. I think the bigger questions now is who is paying for Epstein's operation, who is behind Epstein's operation. Those are the questions that I think are more and more interesting now as we look at the state of the world today. Yeah. Um, you've talked about this hip hop agenda. What is hip hop agenda? Um, the hip hop agenda is a set of allegations that have been made um, within the hip hop ecosystem. And it's kind of, you know, you have to be careful about what terminology we use because hip hop culture is inherently, they almost speak a different language. Like rappers have sort of evolved this, this, their own dialect in a lot of ways. Um, and so the rumors and the allegations that kind of circulate in the hip hop industry, uh, they float back and forth in this weird place where it's hard to know what's real allegations and what's not. Um, the hip hop agenda is one that comes from this really bizarre interview that aired back in 2018 when the Trump Doral Hotel shooting happened. And it was this guy that was like a Trump supporter bodybuilder that walked into the Trump Hotel and shot off a bunch of rounds for no reason and basically got himself arrested to allegedly send a message to Donald Trump. And at the time, he seemed like a crazy person, a totally crazy person. And he still does a little bit. But he made all these allegations in that interview he did from the hospital that he was a Diddy sex slave and that he had had sex with Diddy and his girlfriend, Cassie Ventura, while Diddy watched and filmed. And he made all these allegations before anyone knew anything about it. And at the time, everyone was like, what is this guy talking about? And now you fast forward five years and you realize that all the things he said about Diddy were spot on the money. And if he was a Diddy sex slave, then it's likely that what he's saying about what he heard and learned from that time with Diddy probably has some weight to it as well. 
if you can piece through what is fact and what is fiction in that interview. And he alleges in that interview that the hip hop agenda is basically the drug smuggling ring that happens within the hip hop industry using the private jets of hip hop stars because private jets don't get screened by customs or DEA when they fly around the country. And so he alleges that the hip hop industry is being used to traffic large quantities of drugs, both marijuana, cocaine in liquid form, cocaine in powder form, all sorts of other drugs across and around the country on behalf of organized crime and probably laundering the money through the hip hop industry, through these parties and various shows and events and album record sales and such, which is like the music industry has a long history with organized crime, with the mob, with money laundering. It's one of the most sort of like criminally tied industries there is. And so it, there's there's an air of truth to what he's saying that that right now it's just hearsay and allegations from, you know, a guy. Um, but the more you start to look around, you start to realize that there might be a lot of, you know, a lot of juice in that squeeze, so to speak, if we start to dig into it. So right now I'm in the process of digging into it and we'll see what turns up. Did he provide any evidence, any photos of him hanging out with Diddy or Cassie, anything like that? To my knowledge, he did not provide any physical evidence any corroboratory evidence at all. To my knowledge, it is 100% hearsay what that interview is. I don't think he would have had an opportunity to provide any, really. Um, it, I'm not sure because he was like arrested on as a, as a shooter, as a lot active shooter. And that interview was conducted before he had even sort of been processed and taken to jail. Um, so I have not followed his case through. There's a lot to do and I intend to. Um, but no, I don't. I treat that as just hearsay right now. And I'm not aware of him presenting any verifiable evidence other than what he claimed versus what we now know about Diddy specifically. So and that was in 2018. Yeah. So take it all with a grain of salt. Your views on pharmaceutical and vaccine industry. I did not have any real thoughts about vaccines or about the pharmaceutical industry for most of my life. I mean, I was raised to put health first and I've always been a healthy person. I've always been relatively athletic and I have some sort of undiagnosed Crohn's disease or autoimmune disease that my mom has and it's really affected her life in major ways. And so because I saw her struggling with that, I caught it very early in myself in puberty and basically healed myself with diet um, by cutting out all processed foods and all sorts of like garbage that most people eat. And so I, I have had this weird relationship where for the longest time, I didn't really have an opinion of pharmaceutical like industries other than that i think the solutions are probably you know diet based usually but it wasn't until covid that i was sort of like all of us was forced to form an opinion and i had no idea how strong of an opinion i was about to form because i come from the democratic party i come from a liberal household and a liberal background and so my whole life, we had been critical of big corporations and of big pharma. And my whole life, the Democratic Party had been relatively anti big pharma. And we had lots of examples from things like Vioxx um, poisoning people, um, poisoning mothers, poisoning infants to Johnson and Johnson with asbestos in their baby powder. There, there's lots of examples of big pharma doing atrocious things. And so it was very weird um, to arrive in 2020 and have my family, the Democratic Party, suddenly basically advertising for Big Pharma. And at first I was kind of swayed by it um, before I started to look into it more for myself. And um, somewhere around the Black Lives Matter protests, when we had like a certain narrative being given to us about masks and about safety measures and about crowds and about not even going to gyms to get healthy during the pandemic, a certain set of rules applied to all those situations. And then all those rules were abandoned for Black Lives Matter protests. And those were cheered on by the exact same politicians, like burning, like I lived right near Seattle. My girlfriend had to leave Seattle because she lived right next to that CHOP autonomous zone that they established in Seattle where people were getting shot. So I'm watching the same politicians cheering on maskless riots and burning in the streets. And then the very next day they're on TV telling me you're not allowed to go to the gym without a mask because you're going to make grandma sick. And that just... Put, set off alarm bells in every direction. And since then, all the research I've done and all the people I've gotten to talk to and learn about, I have a very strong opinion now um, that I think it's a gigantic racket. And I think there's an enormous pile of evidence 
to show that. And the only answer that the pharmaceutical industry has ever had has been to censor that information. And I think that one of the most acute and and simplest examples of that censorship is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who was a darling of the left. He was a darling of the Democrats his whole life. He was the water keeper. He was, he was the environmental guy. And then the moment that he started looking into the actual evidence about vaccines and about how much money pharmaceutical companies are raking in on vaccines, he gets banned on all platforms. He gets censored on all platforms. Um, when his book, The Real Anthony, The Real Anthony Fauci, it is one of the most cited sourced books I've ever read. And it is it lays it all out in no unclear terms with studies to back up everything that it says that it's not even it's not even a conspiracy theory. It's it's literally just the way that business works. It's the way that big business works. And when you start to learn how the pharmaceutical industry works, you see the incentive structures for them to push things like vaccines because it's a lot more profitable to give a medication to everybody than it is to give a medication to only sick people. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of other conspiracies of like, yeah, or you could make everyone sick and then sell them Ozempic is a very present one on my mind right now. But regardless, it's, it's baffling to me to see the Democratic Party become the big pharma party with no like hindsight as to what we've known our whole lives about big pharma. Um, so one of my favorite shirts that I sell now and that I wear most often says food, not pharma right across the front, because I think the vast majority of these diseases have only existed since processed foods and fake oils and all these other things have been fed into us. Most of them never existed for our whole lives. And we were getting along just fine without this chronic disease epidemic. And the way that the people speaking up about the chronic disease epidemic, like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., but many others as well, the way they've been treated and smeared as conspiracy theorists and radicals and demonized at the same time as our FDA is saying that Fruit Loops is healthier than eggs is just like clear as day to me what's going on. You have a tremendous following. You're very outspoken. Do you worry that you could be censored and banned? Yeah, I I have been censored and banned in some regards. Um, I It's kind of baked into my strategy from the very start because I started on TikTok where there is the most censorship of any platform right now. I learned pretty early on how the AIs that are in our algorithms sort of watch our content and censor us based on keywords, censor us based on topics. So I learned a lot of strategies for how to avoid sort of the algorithmic censorship. And then I also diversified across a wide array of platforms so that I am censorship resistant. Um, and I accrued enough of a following base that I have enough subscriber support now that just support me because of what I do, not because of any specific views on any specific videos that now, even if I was taken off of all the platforms, I would still be able to keep on supporting myself and doing the research I do and publish it somewhere else. So th there's a strategy to getting around the censorship in this modern world for better or for worse. You know, we are supposed to have free speech, but in reality, I think the job of an independent journalist today is to protect their free speech, not just to exercise it as well. So what are some of the keywords that we should uh, stay away from to make sure we don't get banned? It depends on the platform, somewhat ironically. TikTok shows us sort of all the censorship at once. And so in my experience, the things that get most censored on TikTok are anything that aligns with sort of the military industrial intelligence complexes agendas that includes the CIA, that includes the forever wars, whether it's the Ukraine war or the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, that includes a lot of the big corporate industries, some of the like uh, untouchable corporate industries like big pharma, COVID and the vaccines. Um, it includes things like anything to do with elections uh, because you know the CIA is very concerned with elections, of course, only overseas, they would never be concerned with ours. Um, but if you it, it's it's ironic and it's it's abhorrent that actually TikTok censors videos discussing our free and fair elections, even ones that aren't conspiracy theories, even ones that are just talking about elections. They censor us Americans talking about elections as if it was they say it is election interference or like election integrity is their buzzword because they're protecting our elections by censoring our First Amendment free speech about our elections, which is the most just asinine thing I could ever imagine. But that kind of runs the gambit is anything that is sort of part of the establishment, like public culture war narrative or real war narrative. Um, those are the, the most sensitive topics. What are your views on Gaza, Israel? They're always evolving and they're very complex, especially to bring with no context. But in general, I didn't have strong views on it at all 
um, until I started ironically researching it for a different piece that overlapped with Israel and Gaza. And I felt uninformed. This was back last year, like in August and September of last year. And I realized how uninformed I was about it. And so I started doing my own research piece about Israel and Gaza, and I actually finished it and published it on October 6th, um, which I could never have imagined how weird that timing would have been. And, um, and my views then when I finished that research piece and my views still to this day are that I see Israel as having entered into their state initially on the backs of an immense power and money complex of both the Rothschild banking empire being literally the people in the Balfour Declaration who were assigned this land by the British Empire, all the way to the financing of the initial Israeli state by massive financial interests, being armed and supplied by the Jewish mob, sending weapons from America to the paramilitary groups that were fighting for the founding of Israel. And then those paramilitary groups that were fighting for the founding of Israel, all being so intense that the government of Israel newly formed had to label them all as terrorist organizations because they had essentially been committing acts of terrorism in order to found that state. And the people that led all of those groups went on to lead Israel for the next 20 to 30 years. So my view on Israel is that its founding, whether you feel like its founding was justified or not, it was founded by some pretty harsh people that had a lot of violence in their past and large amounts of money backing what they were doing. And that tends to lead to corruption when you have people that can commit violence and have lots of money. And when you look at the history of Israel, there is an incredible amount of corruption, an incredible amount of um, doing things that are unconscionable for the sake of the survival of the state. And I would I would put Jeffrey Epstein in that bucket. More and more, the evidence is stacking up that Jeffrey Epstein was an Israeli operation, right down to Ehud Barak, the ex-prime minister of Israel, being what looks to have been Jeffrey Epstein's handler, both in the 80s and all the way through the 2000s. So my opinion is that I am not a huge fan of Israel's state and their government and their policies. I would be one of those Israelis that is out there protesting Bibi Netanyahu's regime. Um, but I also don't think it's simple. I think that there is an argument to be made. Like, I don't think that you can like the, the camp that goes like all Jews are bad and like all Jews are, should like, that is not helpful at all. That is super destructive to a productive conversation. Um, there's no simple way out of it, but I certainly don't think that bombing civilians in Gaza is doing any good for Gazans. But I also think that it is the leading cause of like this new anti-Semitism in the world too, because it's just on full display in front of all of us how uncompromising that that regime is regardless of the life human life consequences and regardless of the political consequences overseas too in your opinion what is anti-semitism great question we'll see a different it's getting thrown around so much these days and i i speak on this a fair bit too that I think that anti-Semitism is getting wildly overused by people that are defending Israel um, from passing legislation in America that's like sort of aligning, criticizing the Israeli government with anti-Semitism in our own laws, as well as just people online throwing the anti-Semite label at someone who says, I don't support the war in Gaza. And that debases the value of that term because violence against Jewish people because they are Jewish is a very real historical phenomenon, just like violence against black people is a very real historical phenomenon. And we need a word reserved for real violence against groups of people because they're in that group. And if you start to throw that word around just because someone is having a complex political discussion about the state of Israel, or even if you like, I get thrown, that label gets thrown at me just for talking about Jeffrey Epstein and saying that Jeffrey Epstein looks like he was Mossad. That starts to make the word anti Semitism mean less and less and less every time it gets used in the exact same way that today the word racist is getting is like the new most common insult. And it makes it so that when you actually call someone a racist, it's not really like racism is getting debased in the same way where we no longer have a word that's strong enough to condemn the truly condemnable. Okay, so you you touched on Epstein. Clarify that. It's hard to explain in any sort of short form style because there's it, any kind of conclusion about an intelligence agency operation or a conclusion about like a sex trafficking ring has to be based on a ton of evidence because like I said earlier, it's all obfuscated and it's all designed to be deniable, plausible deniability. But 
if for anyone that hasn't read Whitney Webb's book, One Nation Under Blackmail, it's a two volume book that is the most well sourced and complete uh, examination of the entire Jeffrey Epstein network the things that led to it, the people that were involved in it, the people that brought him to power, the people that engaged with him and helped him. It's the it's the most complete assessment done to date by far. And it paints a very clear picture. And it goes from everything from like just everyone in his network being associated with Israel in various ways, like Leslie Wexner is one of the largest pro-Israel philanthropists in the world, um, to his association with groups like the Mega Group, which is basically a bunch of Zionist billionaires that do things on behalf of Israel together, to uh, associate, like to during the 1980s, a lot of people don't know what Jeffrey Epstein did before he was human trafficking. Um, and this is this time in his life when he was allegedly a bounty hunter for billionaires is the way that he described it to people. But what he was actually doing during that time is he was doing arms trafficking and he was doing money laundering for arms traffickers. And he was arms trafficking with a British guy named Douglas Lease and with this other guy named uh, Adnan Khashoggi, who's one of the most famous arms dealers of all time. And his handler, the guy that brought him into those circles, was Ehud Barak and Robert Maxwell. And Robert Maxwell is one of the most infamous Israeli Mossad's, I guess he's not technically Israeli, but he's a Mossad spy of all time. And Ehud Barak at the time was one of the highest figures in the Israeli intelligence apparatus, and then later went on to become the prime minister of Israel. Um, so Jeffrey Epstein was brought from the corrupt financial world of Bear Stearns into the arms trafficking and money laundering world by two senior level Israeli intelligence people. And then over the next decade, that transformed into running a blackmail operation in close ties with Robert Maxwell's daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell. So those are just some of the ties to Israel, but there are numerous. And we were told by Alex Acosta that he was told to back off and leave him alone because he's intelligence. And so if that's true, which it looks like it probably was, because how else would you run this operation? Then you're left with which intelligence was he? And a lot of these intelligence agencies work together. So if he was Mossad, he probably worked with the CIA and with the FBI, or sorry, and with MI6 from time to time. But if you look at the evidence and you look at his network and you look at who he was, it seems most likely by a long shot, in my opinion, that he was primarily an asset for Israel and Mossad, targeting America and everyone else. And he probably also occasionally did other deals with other people too, because that's kind of how spies do their thing. But wow. <laughs> yeah. Highly recommend people check out Whitney Webb's book, One Nation Under Blackmail. If they haven't read it, it's a two volume book. It's very dense, but it leaves no stone unturned. It's really a masterwork of journalism of the 21st century. Let's talk about the economy, uh, the current financial situation and where yeah. it's It's tragic. Um, it's tragic that politics has to be so overlapped over the economy right now because the amount of gaslighting happening on our televisions is unprecedented. And for this campaign season to try to overlay this narrative of everything's fine, but I'm also going to make it better next when I get elected. And this just this whole made up narrative about the economy while people are paying $18 for a Big Mac and $7 for a carton of eggs is just asinine. And I, I think there's a million directions you can go at it. But the, the angle that is inherently and intentionally, I believe, not talked about is that inflation is not like it's not Donald Trump's fault. It's not Kamala Harris's fault. It's not Joe Biden's fault. Inflation comes from the Federal Reserve printing money and the Federal Reserve printing money like they come out in their Fed meetings as though they don't understand what's going to happen and they couldn't really predict and maybe we'll have a soft landing. And it's like that is all. These are the most advanced, educated financial professionals in the world, and they are being hired to run the most powerful monetary agency in the world today, the Federal Reserve. And they are they do not have that job because they don't understand that when you print money, you get inflation. They know that, but they come out on stage and act as if they could not have predicted this inflation because it's their job to act like they don't know that. But when inflation happens, we all suffer because our prices go up, our dollars become less valuable. But rich people don't live by dollars. They have assets, they have stocks, they have homes, they have art, they have all they have companies. And those things all go up in value during inflation. 
because that dollars are all worth less, so all the assets are worth more. And so inflation is inherently very beneficial to what you could call the ruling class, the oligarchs, the rich people. And so when everyone's, you know, throwing mud at each other over this political, it's Kamala's fault, it's Donald's fault. The Federal Reserve is very intentionally staying quiet and in the center because they are the ones that are deciding to print money. And I'm, you know, there's a lot of economic factors involved in that. But these cycles of easing and tightening and easing and tightening every single time we get poorer and the wealthy get wealthier as their assets inflate. And they know these cycles. And if you watch what the wealthy people do, they sell assets when it's good to sell. And then they buy up a bunch of assets when more inflation is coming. And they they ride these cycles intentionally because these cycles are designed to trickle all the wealth upwards. And we're just feeling it particularly strongly right now. How do you feel about Trump and Kamala? I feel very strongly that we have mountains of evidence that Kamala Harris is the military industrial intelligence complex's candidate. The CIA openly endorsed Biden when they condemned the Hunter Biden laptop back in 2020 with their letter from 50 intelligence officials, even though they knew at the time that it was a real laptop. That was obviously the CIA and the intelligence assets endorsing Joe Biden and trying to cover for him. And now we have just seen, I think, 700 intelligence experts endorse Kamala Harris in the last week. And it's like, people need to be reminded, 700 intelligence analysts and experts is 700 professional liars. Like the CIA is not the good guys. And when the CIA is endorsing Kamala Harris and Kamala Harris is promoting these wars overseas and promoting these policies of this like gigantic corporate establishment, and everything is pointing at is like, and all of that is pointing at Donald Trump and trying to lawfare him, assassinate him, smear him. I look at that power dynamic and that skews me towards Trump in a big way. I'm very concerned about Trump's rhetoric about Iran and going to war in Iran. I'm very concerned about Trump's rhetoric about Israel. There's a lot of things about Trump that I do not like. Um, but given the choice today, I am clearly on Trump's side. I also was on Bobby's side, RFK Jr.'s side in the middle somewhere there for a while. And as he got close to Trump and endorsed Trump and is now on Trump's transition team talking about he's already selecting cabinet members, he's already working on this process that derailed Trump in 2016, where he kind of got manipulated and taken advantage of. It's really heartening to see Bobby say what he's saying about Trump and Nicole for that matter. And so that gives me more faith in that camp, even though I got a lot of reservations and my job will always be to hold the powerful to account. I would rather hold the Trump administration to account than the Kamala Harris administration to account for the next four years. Who do you think will win? I think if we have a free and fair election, I think Trump will win on a landslide, without a doubt. I think it is inconceivable that we will have a free and fair election all the way from big media bias to lawfare interference to assassination attempt interference right down to vote counting, electronic ballots, mail-in voting, all sorts of things that we've seen many years before. And it's like this taboo to say that there could ever be election interference in American elections. But like the CIA was founded to interfere in everyone else's elections and they've been doing it ever since. And you just go to Wikipedia and read the article about CIA interference in foreign elections. And you'd realize that that's their job and they would never do it here. But I would like a little more reassurance that they wouldn't do it here. Like, for example, making it illegal for illegal aliens to vote, for non-citizens to vote, because that should not be happening. You know, having double counts, having some just normal ballot security measures. So we'll see. Maybe you can answer this fast. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. Your views on China, Russia, war in Ukraine. I think that the war in Ukraine was instigated by the CIA. I think that the 2014 Maidan revolution was probably a CIA color revolution. And we've moved NATO right up to Russia's borders and poked the bear so much that they had to retaliate. And then we pointed all our cameras at the bear and said, look, that bear is evil and he's the aggressor. And it's the same playbook we've always used. So I don't love Russia and I don't love China. I do not love a lot of the things they've got going on over there. I think there's a lot to criticize about all these other countries too, but that does not mean that they are trying to take over the world and that they are the next Hitler and that we need to spend billions of dollars and millions of lives in other countries fighting wars that are not our own to do it. The only people that wins from that is the military industrial complex that's making all this money from it. So now on a more personal uh, note, what advice would you give um, people who want to be in your position? 
speaking specifically to social media or having a voice in in the world today, what I would say, if I had, could only give one piece of advice, it's that you're never going to make it without your voice. Um, for a couple of reasons we talked about earlier, and, and mainly just because people don't want fakeness. They don't want an act. People want something genuine. And you'd be surprised how far being genuine can get you. And so I would, I would suggest that if you want to have a voice, if you want to share something, the most important thing is that it matters to you. Because if you're just trying to speak in order to get likes and in order to get views, that's not genuine. And you need to be willing to put in the work when you're not yet getting views. So you need to enjoy what you're doing. If you wouldn't do it to a room of 10 people, you're never going to get to do it to a room of 10,000 people. So make sure that whatever you're choosing to do, it's what you love to do and it's what you really want to do. And you would do it on your spare time. You would do it, you know, on your days off because that's what it takes to kind of get there a lot of times. And that's what will keep you going for the long run. So just be true to you and do what's, you know, actually right for you. Okay. Anything else you want to add that I didn't ask you? Um, No, it's been a really great interview. I really appreciate your vibe and you got great questions. So thanks for having me on.